Congresswoman Maria Elvira Salazar of Miami easily won re-election last month. She beat Democrat Annette Tadeo. Representative Salazar is a conservative Cuban-American but doesn't always fit stereotypical ideas about what that means. She is a former TV anchor and reporter at home in front of a camera. And on Friday, I sat down with her for a talk and we began with a subject she is passionate about, immigration. You were a first-time candidate. You have been advocating for comprehensive immigration reform, and as we all know, it has not happened. With the uh, Republicans controlling the House, uh, is it possible that there could be that kind of reform? Of course. What do you mean is not happening? It's going to happen. Why? But, because but it has not happened. Yeah. Well, it has not happened, but it will happen within the next two years now that we, the Republicans, we are in, in charge. Like you said, in the last two years, I've spent most of my time talking to my colleagues on both sides of the aisle, right. asking them, how can we fix immigration? I have gathered a lot of information, and I am happy to inform you that I will reintroduce my Dignity Act within the next few, I mean, after the new year. Right. And I'm going to not only do the illegal part, but I'm going to incorporate a new reform for the legal immigration. We have a major problem in this country, and the yeah, Dignity we, Act will fix almost everything. Yeah. Let Secure me just the border, jump in. Uh, it, Congresswoman, uh -huh. let me jump in. You know, this will happen if uh, Speaker designate Kevin McCarthy gets behind it. Has uh, Mr. McCarthy told you, in fact, he will support your Dignity Act? Well, the Dignity Act is now in flux, as I told you. We are re refurbishing it. We are refining it. We are incorporating the different opinions of both parts of, of both sides of the aisle. Mm -hmm. And like I said, it's going to be a, a better bill that will also include legal immigration. And look, we are at a point in this country where both parties understand and recognize that we have a major mess at the border. You're right. We have problems with the economy. We need hands to work. We have supply chain problems. We have high inflation. And my bill, with all humility, I believe will solve all those problems overnight. Mm -hmm. And on top of that is the moral right Christian thing to do. Congresswoman, let me, our time is going to be limited here, but I want you to comment on the situation in Venezuela. As you know, the Biden administration has managed to get together uh, the Maduro regime and Juan Guaido, head of the opposition, for talks yep. about somehow making that government more small d democratic. And also, to part of the deal would be that three billion dollars uh, in Venezuelan government money, which has been sitting in an escrow account, would go to humanitarian aid to help Venezuelan exiles and others in the country. Uh, are you in yeah. favor of this? Is this a good idea? Look, as you know, this is pretty complicated, but we are always in favor of finding democracy anywhere in the hemisphere. I do believe that the Maduro regime always has a, a hidden agenda. And that Maduro, as he's done it in other occasions, always finds this conversation or these peace talks to buy time. Right. Um, I have been talking to some parts of the opposition, the Venezuelan opposition. Who are we to say to Guaido, don't sit with, the, with the, this dictator? I think that we should include other members of the uh, Venezuelan opposition, including Maria Corina, including Leopoldo Lopez. It's up to the Venezuelans, but I always forewarn them, as I have, to the Colombian, the uh, President Petro's representative, whom I just had a good conversation with. I said, you got to be very careful, because what we need to see is free, uh, um, ele free uh, elections in Venezuela with international observers, Right. where the Maduro regime will have to give up part of his, of his um, power market share. Right. You it's know, up to them, but I'm going to be very observant and sure. obviously uh, uh, vigilant 
and respectful of whatever the Democratic, the uh, Venezuelan opposition wants to do. Right. And Congresswoman, as you well know, I'm sure, uh, the Chevron Oil Corporation out of Texas would also, in this deal, have the right to really up its production of oil yeah. uh, out of Venezuela, would add 200,000 barrels per month, I believe, to what it produces. And some of that oil would be brought to the United States again for refining. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That seems like yeah. sort of a win-win, doesn't it? Of course. Of course. And I think the Biden administration should have um, asked for more democratic concessions and not just give everything to uh, the Maduro regime, which is exactly what they want. They want to bring the American companies to help them refine that oil anywhere in the world and mm -hmm. just get those dollars. It's a problem because we know that Maduro, just like the Castros and just like all these tyrannical regimes, all they want to do is they want to have that economic oxygen to continue right. repressing uh, their, their people. I mean, it's the same, I, I do not, it, it happens all over and over again. And that's mm -hmm. why with the United States, and I'm part of the world of, of the um, Foreign Affairs Committee, I'm always saying, hey, we want to negotiate with anyone, but they have they have to play by the democratic rules. Right. And, they, and sometimes the Biden administration forgets that, Mike, but me, you know, it's, and I don't get it. You, you cannot play ball with those who are yeah. brutalizing their people on the streets. And period. They are, they are not the most trustworthy people in government. All right, uh, Maria Elvira Salazar, hold on a minute. We're going to take a brief break. Be back with more questions. In this okay. Kevin McCarthy has going, is going to have a very small majority when he takes over as the House Speaker. He's going to have 220 Republicans, 213 Democrats. And what a lot of analysts are afraid of, and maybe you as well, is that yeah. some of the radical right-wing members of the Republican Party, like Marjorie Taylor Greene, are going to sort of have his ear and help drive the agenda. Are you worried about that? Well, let me tell you, uh, I hear that all the time and here in Congress, um, and we're going to be here all next week and uh, uh, up until uh, Christmas, probably. Look, Nancy Pelosi had the same majority, maybe three or four seats. And she, according to my position, destroyed the economy by being able to pass all those bills that spend more than we needed to. And that's why we have the inflation we have. So I don't see why Kevin cannot do the same thing in trying to fix what Nancy undid with the same type of majority, four people, a, a, a very slim uh, majority. Let's give them the chance. We, we promised the, the American people that we were going to try to fix the economy, steal the border, respect parents' rights in knowing what their kids are studying. We're, we, we promised uh, very specific norms. I'm going to give the opportunity to Kevin to be able to bring those bills to the floor. We're going to vote on, in my case, you know, I'm pretty independent. I'm one of the most bipartisan members of Congress. Uh, you have I vote, indeed. what, 27? I, yeah. Of course. Yeah, we, because, we understand that. So uh, let, let's see. Let's give, them, let, let's give them the opportunity because what we do know, Michael, is that the American people decided to give the Senate to the Dems and the House to the Republicans. And that's the beauty of this system. Yeah. Let the system play out. And, and American and, and voters forces, like uh -huh. it that way. In fact, they like yeah. in many ways a split Congress. Uh, Congresswoman, let me go back to the Tell immigration me. subject for a, you know, a topic near and dear to you and frankly dear very, to me as well, very, which is very. the fate of the dreamers. I mean, here we have these thousands of young people, well now people in their 20s, even their early 30s who are brought here as children, they've built lives for themselves, they contribute to society, but they live in this kind of legal limbo. How is that going to be resolved? But look, Michael, you're telling me and you're talking to me about the dreamers. We're talking DACA. But I go further and deeper. Why don't we talk about those people who have been here in this country for more than 20 years, let's say, and they have been in the shadows and they are not DACA, they are not DAPA, they are not TPS. These are regular people who have been contributing with the economy and 
we and the big entrepreneurs have given them jobs for for decades. Right. And thanks to those people, we have food on our table. So I'm talking about everyone. That's the Dignity Act gives dignity to the DACA, to the Dreamers, to their parents, to so the TPS, and to your, all. They're covered of by course, your act as well. Of course. Yeah. I need you to read my bill, and I need you to be one of those advocates because my dignity bill. It covers, and you know, a brown girl from the hood, a Hispanic girl from Little Havana, is the one telling, uh, telling both sides of Democrats and Republicans that we need to fix the immigration. And I'm very happy that you're bringing up that topic. Yeah. Because with a good immigration law, good immigration reform, we're going to fix four things that we have. We're going to be able to, to overnight have millions of workers because we have a great labor shortage. Number two is going to, is a moral thing to do. Number three, we're going to seal the border and no more fentanyl, no more coyotes. And number four, we're going to fix inflation. Immigration is the big problem, one of the big problems in this it, country. It is indeed. I have one and last question. And I'm the question. only member, I'm Be the only member who created an immigration reform bill last, the last cycle. I, and now that I got reelected, it. I'm yeah. the only one I, in both I, parties we, because the Dems did not dare to put up on the floor because we, they knew that we're not going to have the vote. We remember one final question, purely political. Recently, yeah, as you know, political, okay. former, former President Trump had at Mar-a-Lago for dinner, yay, yeah. Kanye West, yay, and a white nationalist, white supremacist named Nick Fuentes, and really yeah. has not sort of apologized for having anti-Semitic white nationalists to dinner with him. What's your view on that? Yeah, well, you know, he didn't call me to ask me if he should have invited these two gentlemen. We also know that the empirical evidence is that Trump was one of the uh, was one of the giants for the Jewish community in this country, and he dared yeah, but to what do. What signal does the what does this send well, to, I, to Jewish Americans? I, you know that he is sitting down with anti-Semites. I think that, he, like I said, I would have not done it. I would have not invited them because anything that sounds or smells anti-Semitic is not good for me, is not good for the country because right. th they are a very important community in this country. But at the same time, I have to see what he did during his presidency. And, uh, and, uh, and I can only say to you that he dared to move that embassy from yeah. to Jerusalem and so many people yeah. uh, reacted against him and he still did it. So I, I understand what you're saying. I do not understand why they were there. I would have not done it, but still he has an impeccable record when it comes to the Jewish American relations.